even in some sects or, or, or groups, they will swear by Allah and lie, but if they swear by certain people, they would never lie. This is a catastrophe. So the person is better than Allah in your eyes. You say, you swear by, by Hassan or Hussein, for example, and you will not lie. But you swear by Allah and you lie something normal. That's something very dangerous. So, using oaths for emphasis, the Prophet I said it many times, he would say, I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul. This is who? Allah. He's swearing by Allah, but in a different way. I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba. So the Kaaba was something very great for Quraysh, for the people that were living there. They had reverence for Kaaba, the first place built to worship Allah from the days of Ismail and Ibrahim alayhi salam. It was venerated. So Allah, the Prophet ﷺ would swear by the Lord of the Kaaba. He doesn't swear by Kaaba, of course, but he swears by Allah. But he would mention the Lord of the Kaaba. So showing that this is something I'm very serious, very important, and the people would take it seriously. We can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swore in the Quran many times. وَالشَّمْسِ وَالْحَاهَا When we see wa, wallahi, billahi, tallahi, this is swearing by Allah. The wa, the ba, and the ta. These three letters in Arabic, these are used for qasam, for oath, for swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Question? Did you say something? Uh, so we said technique number 14, using oaths for emphasis. Obviously it shouldn't be overused, but can be used to draw people's attention and to make something very serious or important. Number 15, repeat, repeat, repeat. Okay? So during the Prophet's time, people didn't obviously take notes. As we mentioned, the Arabs were known as illiterate people. Ummi, they don't read and write. It's an oral tradition, verbal. So the Prophet ﷺ would repeat things that he would say. Number one, for emphasis, to show that it's something important. Number two, so people can remember it. So that it will stick in their mind. So the Prophet ﷺ would repeat himself. So you can see someone like Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, sitting in a class and the people would ask him, why aren't you taking notes? Then he would say back all the ahadith. Now, of course, there are some people, Allah bless them also, a special memory. I mean, to give you an example of Imam Bukhari, Imam Bukhari is who? Who is Imam Bukhari? Anyone heard of Imam Bukhari? When we say this hadith is narrated by Bukhari and Muslim, we're talking about people. Muslim doesn't mean any Muslim. Muslim is someone's name, right? We know that. Bukhari and Muslim are two great scholars. Bukhari in reference to Bukhara. Bukhara is in the area today of Uzbekistan, is that right? in the area of Uzbekistan. So he was called Bukhari because that's where he was from. Look at some of the great scholars of Hadith. They were not even originally Arab. But when they entered into Islam and they studied, they became scholars of the Arabic language and they became scholars of the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and they did great things to preserve this religion. So Imam Bukhari, so don't ever feel if you're not an Arab or something like this, doesn't mean you can do great things for Islam. So Imam Bukhari, actually his book is considered the most authentic book on the face of the planet after the Qur'an. Some uh, close to 8,000 hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in his collection. So they came to Imam Bukhari, they wanted to test his memory and his knowledge. So the students, they played a trick on him. They said, we will write down 10 hadith and 10 chains of narration and we'll mix them up. So we'll put the wrong chain of narration on the wrong hadith, and so on. Then we'll go to Imam Bukhari, we'll recite all of it, and we'll see if he knows or not, can he tell. So they recited 10 chains of narration mixed up with 10 different hadith, right? And they said, what do you say about these hadith? They narrated all of it. Imam Bukhari said, he repeated back to them everything they narrated, wrong. He repeated it back. Then he said, the correct way is like this, and he recited all of it correctly. Can you imagine? So they came to him, they said something they made up. He remembered all of it. He gave it back to them wrong. What they said, he said, this is what you said, it's wrong, this is the correct way. He gave them the correct chains of narration with the correct ahadith. So imagine this kind of ability, ability to memorize, ability to learn, subhanAllah. Uh, so if there was something that needed emphasis, the Prophet wasallam would repeat it three times. So imagine this. The Sahaba, they had actually overslept for Fajr prayer. 
They overslept. They put someone in charge to be the alarm clock to wake everyone up. He fell asleep. Human. By, by accident. Weakness. So the sun had risen to the point where it was hot and woke people up. So they woke up. They said, oh my God, the sun is up. We didn't pray fashion. They went running to make wudu to wash themselves. The Prophet ﷺ had the call for prayer made and they were going to pray in jama'ah. They overslept. It's not their fault. It's not something that was done on purpose. So immediately once you realize you've overslept for a prayer or missed a prayer, you forgot, you have to make it up. So the Sahaba were rushing though and making it fast because they were upset. So they were making wudu in such a way that they didn't wash their heels properly. They just wiped on their feet fast in their wudu. So if your wudu is incorrect, if you didn't wash all the body parts, your prayer will be invalid. Your wudu will not count, your prayer will not count. Wudu is evolution, right? Washing for the prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ noticed this thing. So he came and he started calling out. So imagine listening to the Prophet ﷺ saying this, Beware and destroyed are the ankles from the hellfire. He started calling out at the top of his voice, repeating it over and over. Right? So imagine you are listening to this and you are doing your wudu, you will realize oh, I'm doing something wrong. So you will go back and do it. Correctly. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Woe to the heels from the fire. Meaning you will, you will not be protected from the fire if you don't make your wudu properly. Your prayer will be invalid as well, obviously, and so on. So, uh, there are a couple of techniques involved in this. Number one, the companions had stopped for Salat al-Fajr and the Prophet ﷺ was coming behind them. When he neared them, he saw that because of the coldness, uh, well, this is a different incident than that he's, he's narrating here. He said, because of the coldness of night, they were not fully cleaning their feet and getting the water on their ankles. So the Prophet ﷺ came near to them, raised his voice, and said, Beware and destroy from the ankles, uh, are the ankles from the hellfire. And he repeated it over and over. So just imagine how you would feel if you were not making wudu properly, and you heard these words. So you'll hear many times if you read through the narrations, sometimes they'll bring the line that the Prophet ﷺ said, and then they will say, and he repeated it three times. And he repeated it three times. So this is obviously for attention, drawing people's attention for emphasis, and to help people to remember it. You want us to go all the way with it? So, uh, what? Yeah? Oh, inshallah. So we're not here. Can we keep going? Take a few more techniques? We have 21 in total. Or is it too much for one day? Rule one, do not bore the listener. <laughs> <laughs> so we're asking you. Should we keep going? Okay. So technique number 16, calling out to the listener and then remaining silent. Has anyone ever tried this technique? Calling out some, to someone and then remaining silent. So, the Prophet ﷺ would call the listener by his name, causing him to pay attention without answering or telling the listener why he is calling him. So can you imagine this technique? Seems strange to us maybe, but see how much impact it would have. have. So for example, the hadith of Mu'ad, where he is traveling with the Prophet ﷺ, and he ﷺ said, Ya Mu'adh, O Mu'adh. And Mu'adh radiallahu anhu would say, Labbaik ya Rasulullah wa sa'daik. Labbaik is like we say in Hajj, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, right? Labbaik means, O Allah, O Messenger of Allah, I'm here answering your call. Wa sa'daik, I'm here to serve you and bring you happiness, whatever you need. You see the etiquette and the respect they have. Do we respond maybe to our parents, for example, when they call us in such a way? Or do we say, ah, what? Like we're annoyed and we're upset. Right? And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us in the Quran constantly, O oh, you who believe. How do you respond to the call of Allah? And the response is not only verbally, the response is also in your attitude, in your heart, in your actions. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, O oh, you who believe, do this. And then you just turn away and ignore. SubhanAllah. So now, uh, he uh, remains silent. Uh, the, the translation of Labbaik Ya Rasulullah wa Sa'adik I am consistently here for you and constant in your assistance and service 
And then the Prophet ﷺ remained quiet. They traveled on for a bit. And then the Prophet ﷺ again said, Ya Mu'adh. And then Mu'adh responded, La Baika Ya Rasulullah wa Sa'dik. And then he ﷺ remained quiet. A little time passed, and for a third time, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Mu'adh. And Mu'adh said, La Baika Ya Rasulullah wa Sa'dik. Can you imagine now, is Mu'adh anticipating what's going on? Why the Prophet ﷺ is calling me? So the Prophet ﷺ is calling his attention to build up this anticipation and make him very ready to listen to what the Prophet ﷺ is going to say. Could you imagine that he's not going to pay attention after that? Especially when he has a great deal of respect, obviously, and admiration for the Prophet ﷺ. So, when someone's giving a speech, the pauses are almost as important as are his words. It's something they teach right in public speaking. When you're giving a speech, pause here for emphasis, right? Stop here, it's very dramatic, right? They will give this, even for presidents, they tell them, pause here, <laughs> stop here, <laughs> raise your hand, say like this, hit on the podium. They will give them these kind of things actually for more emphasis and effect. So similarly, we see that the Prophet ﷺ is using uh, this. Uh, so sometimes, he gives an example here, he says in some of those movies or cartoons, you look at these characters, there are some characters, they talk all the time. You don't remember actually anything they say, but there are some characters that are silent, they have just very dramatic one line. You always remember that line actually that they said. So similarly, it's not about how much you say, but it's about what you say and how you say it, when you say it, to choose the right time. Uh, technique number 17, making physical contact when speaking. Uh, now we have some, some uh, issues that can come up here, which is culture. Culture. It depends obviously on the people and the culture. What physical contact is appropriate or not? What physical contact is appropriate or not? Uh, for Arabs, for example, it's not acceptable to touch somebody here. The back of the head. You pat someone on the back of the head. This is only a father will do it to a young child. But someone else does it, this is extreme disrespect. You understand? So it depends on the culture. I think in Malay culture also, only certain kind of physical contact is, is acceptable. And also it depends on your relationship with that person and so on. Uh, it's very common in the Middle East, for example, for males to hold hands. Very unacceptable in, for example, a uh, uh, Western society in America. If we see two men holding hands, then we will assume something very bad, obviously, right? <laughs> so maybe in, in uh, Malaysia it's the same thing, I'm not sure. So uh, in the Middle East, I remember the first time I went, in an older age, and I saw people, I was a little bit confused. I said, why are there all these people holding hands? It was like, in, in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca and Medina. But then we discovered this is something out of friendship, not something out of, uh, something haram and so on. So the first time it happened to me, I was about to punch the guy who did it. <laughs> I was 16 years old, and uh, subhanAllah, I had, I had spoken ill of someone else. So this brother, he was actually a student of knowledge, studying in university and so on. He came to visit us. Uh, he knew some of the brothers I was making umrah with. So he came just to sit with us and talk and so on. So after I had done that, he wanted to advise me. And the advice he gave me still stuck with me till now. Like 14 years later, still I can remember the advice and the way he gave the advice. So kind. So gentle, very nice, subhanAllah, it had a big impact on me. But the uh, thing that he did to show like the friendship or the kindness that he doesn't know me that well, but to show that I want to advise you as a friend, not to insult you or, or put you down for what you said. He waited until I was.